A naval vessel's turbines are driven by steam from the ship's boilers, also operating auxiliary steam-driven equipment, providing steam for other purposes as well. The function of a boiler is to generate steam. In this cycle of changing water into steam, the boiler tubes play a vital part. Here is a boiler used for demonstration purposes. In these large downcomer tubes, water is conveyed from the steam drum to the water drum and headers. Then into the furnace, where these small water tubes absorb the furnace heat and generate steam. Then back to the steam drum before going out in the form of steam to the superheaters and the turbines. A rupture in any of these tubes will render a boiler inoperative. In this film, you will see some defective tube conditions and learn what causes these conditions. The Ship's manual is your general guide for all boiler repairs. This manual, along with current directives and manufacturer's instruction books, will give you all the information you will need. Often you may find signs of external corrosion on the lower ends of water wall and division wall tubes where refractory material has pulled away and created water traps. Also, near the water drum and header ends of economizer tubes where soot tends to collect. Here is a sample of another defective tube condition, internal corrosion. This may eventually cause pitting due to oxygen in the feed water. Overheating and eventual bursting of a tube may be caused by scale formation. This failure can also occur if the circulation of water is interrupted due to foreign matter left in the boiler after cleaning. Wherever you find signs of corrosion at the drum ends of downcomer tubes, the tube should be removed and replaced at the first opportunity. You must know at all times the exact condition of the water sides of the boiler. Before and after each regular boiler cleaning, make a thorough visual inspection of all tubes. Another method of detecting faulty tubes is by means of the hydrostatic test to prove the tightness or strength of all boiler parts. Procedures for applying hydrostatic tests are outlined in the Bue Ship's manual. Maintain the specified pressure until the boiler and the tubes are fully inspected. If you find a leaking tube, mark its location on the boiler and then locate it on the tube data sheet. If the leak exists at the tube seat, re-rolling the tube end may correct the condition. If located elsewhere, the tube must be replaced. If the boiler, however, cannot be taken out of service for the duration of the repair job, the tube may be temporarily plugged. In a later section on this series of boiler repair, you'll be shown how to perform each of these procedures. When a tube failure is due to warpage, leakage, or excessive scale formation, the failed tube after removal must be sent for examination to the engineering experiment station at Annapolis, Maryland. Cut the tube into convenient lengths for shipping. Remember to mark each piece so that the tube can be readily reassembled. In chapter 51 of the Bue Ship's manual entitled Boilers, you will find the type of information that must be submitted with a failed tube. Another means of determining true conditions within a boiler is by removal of a tube for inspection during regular overhaul periods or whenever the engineer officer decides an inspection is necessary. Select for removal the tube showing the most distortion, pitting, or corrosion. Or the tube oldest in service, as shown by the machinery history and boiler record sheet. After the tube is removed from the tube bank, it is cut into convenient lengths, then split carefully so that the water sides can be examined. 
This completes the introduction to renewal of boiler tubes. Equally important with the condition of boiler tubes, however, is that of the furnace refractory lining. The surface material used to line a boiler furnace is called refractory. This assists in maintaining a high furnace temperature and thus accelerates the rate of combustion. It confines and directs the flow of gases of combustion through the generating tube banks. Also, refractory protects metal parts of the furnace, such as casings, drums, and headers, from radiant heat and from being impinged by flame and hot gases. Let us see the types of refractory found in a boiler furnace. First, layers of insulating block and insulating brick over which is laid fire brick. These materials protect casings of walls and floors. Plastic fire brick used around burner openings on the furnace front. High temperature castable refractory used interchangeably with plastic fire brick. Plastic and castable chrome ore used on studded water wall tubes and to form corbels. In service, refractory lining may eventually deteriorate due to the cutting action and penetration of slag. To determine the condition of the refractory, inspect the furnace regularly during shutdown periods. You may find conditions calling for immediate repair of the furnace lining, either by patchwork, by partial, or by complete renewal of the refractory. When one or two bricks in the walls or floor of the furnace are badly cracked or spalled, patchwork using plastic fire brick is in order. The same holds true if you find a large crack in the furnace front in the vicinity of the burners, or when a section of refractory is missing. When you find evidence of spalling, peeling, erosion, or heavy slagging, partial rebricking may be necessary if the depth of the damage runs more than one and one half inches on vertical walls. If anchor bolts are oxidized or burned off, chances are the wall needs partial rebricking, or the bricks will bulge in that area, in time becoming loose and falling off. However, when you find these conditions not only in localized areas, but throughout a wall or floor, a complete rebricking job is in order. Plastic chrome ore should be renewed on studded tubes when the ends of the studs are exposed to the extent they show oxidation. If the furnace cannot be fired to bake out the plastic chrome ore, as in the case of units of the reserve fleet, then castable chrome ore should be used for the repair job. Remember, the efficiency and reliability of the boiler depends on the way you make these repairs. Workmanship that will help determine the cruising radius of your ship, in large part, the measure of its military value. Practically all modern naval ships of the destroyer class or larger are powered by steam. The propulsion boilers of these ships are subject to steam side deposits which may be caused by ionized dissolved solids in the boiler water. Steam side deposits can clog the superheater, obstruct the flow of steam and cause superheater tube failure, crippling your ship. To prevent this, the dissolved solids must be controlled. A direct relationship exists between the amount of dissolved solids and the electrical conductivity of boiler water. Therefore, conductivity values can be used 
to determine if boiler water contains an excessive amount of dissolved solids and if corrective action is required. Boiler water must be tested periodically as scheduled in NAVSHIP's technical manual, chapter 9560. In this film, you will see how to perform the conductivity test. The first step in performing the conductivity test is to prepare the test equipment. The conductivity meter must be connected to a 110 volt AC outlet. The meter contains a Wheatstone bridge as its measuring circuit, a manual temperature compensator, and a cathode ray tube as its balance indicator, controlled by the upper dial. Make sure that the conductivity cell is securely fastened to the meter. This cell consists of two platinized electrodes firmly spaced within a plastic shield. Be sure that all the equipment is clean. If it is not clean, it could alter the results of the test. Rinse the thermometer, cell and test beaker with some of the boiler water sample to be tested and discard the rinse. Place the cell in the beaker. Pour at least 200 milliliters of sample water into the beaker. Place the thermometer into the beaker. Turn on the meter and allow it to warm up. The tuning eye will glow when the meter is warm. Next, read the temperature of the solution using the thermometer. In this case, the reading is 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Set the meter's temperature compensation dial to the corresponding value. Remove the thermometer. Move the cell up and down several times to remove any air bubbles that may be trapped on the electrode surfaces. The air vents must be at least one half inch below the surface of the solution. Allow about one half inch clearance at the sides and bottom. Then balance the meter's tuning eye. Rotate the upper dial until the tuning eye deflects to the widest possible angle with sharply defined lines. Here, it is shown far out of balance. Now, approaching balance and correctly balanced. When the tuning eye has been balanced, move the cell up and down a few times. The tuning eye should remain balanced. If it does not, readjust as necessary. Turn off the meter and record the meter's conductivity reading measured in micromoles per centimeter on the required water treatment logs. For 600 pound per square inch boilers and below, this reading should not exceed 1300 micromoles per centimeter. For 1200 pound boilers, it should not exceed 700 micromoles per centimeter. If your reading exceeds these values, it indicates an excess of dissolved solids and corrective action should be taken. Accurate testing requires that proper care of equipment be taken. Rinse the thermometer and beaker with distilled water to be sure that no deposits remain on them. Distillate from shipboard distilling plants is adequate for this purpose. Rinse and store the cell in distilled water. If it is necessary to store the cell out of water at any time, rinse the cell well before it dries. If this is not done, an insoluble coating may form on the electrodes. When testing, this may prevent you from sharpening the tuning eye and it may appear fuzzy.
If this occurs, do not attempt to clean the electrodes by hand. This could cause permanent damage to the electrodes. Instead, rinse the cell again with distilled water and test again. If this does not correct the problem, run a test on the accuracy of the meter and cell